Welcome everyone. Bienvenidos to today's workshop, A Beginner's Guide to Data Literacy, Practicing with DataShare. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants along with Nicole Young who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, which is a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. We're co-facilitating today's workshop, A Beginner's Guide to Data Literacy, Practicing with DataShare, with Eva Holt Russmore from DataShare Santa Cruz County and George Malakowski from the Santa Cruz County Human Services Department. Normally, our course sessions are held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation, but we've had a delay in our interpreter arriving. So we're just going to do English for now, but we're hoping to offer this session again. And in that session, we'll be able to do interpretation. So we apologize if any of you were planning to attend and listen in Spanish. We'll go ahead and turn it over to Eva, who's going to give us a quick overview of DataShare before we dive into more details. Hi, good morning. My name is Eva Holt and I'm happy to be here today. Um, and I'll just say that I started my journey with DataShare as um, not completely data illiterate, but a, a definite novice. So I'm so happy to be on this learning journey with all of you. Um, DataShare Santa Cruz County um, is an interactive platform with over 400 indicators from local, state, and national sources. We aim to have updated version of all our data at all times and of the reports that we also host on the platform. Um, and DataShare is constantly changing with new indicators being added. It is the central hub of information um, that creates alignment by allowing everyone to measure outcomes with the same metrics and indicators. We integrate data sets such as the safety net clinic utilization data that was previously not easily publicly available from local sources. Um, and we know that the platform is used in a variety of ways, including by students, researchers, advocacy, activists, program evaluators uh, for grant writing, and also fundraising. Thanks, Eva. And so today's training, as Eva said, is to just um, learn more about DataShare and how to use it. And we're focused on today on population health data, which we'll describe a little more in a moment. We're going to talk about some different ways to use these broad data sets to, um, to do different kinds of advocacy, to inform policy choices, for program planning, for evaluation, and then just really get into a little bit of detail about some elements that you can use for your own data visualizations and graphs and, and portraying these data in different ways, and how to navigate around some of the basic parts of the site. Um, it can be really overwhelming at first, but there are lots of paths into the data. So we just hope to show you um, a few ways to, to uh, make the data more useful and relevant for your own work. And before we do that, we wanted to get a sense of how you all feel about using data. So we're gonna do a quick poll and just let us know just your reactions to the, the word data how comfortable you feel interpreting data and how comfortable you feel using data. So let's see what you say. Is anyone not seeing the poll? Okay, great. Seeing some responses come in. You might have to scroll down to get to the other questions. Okay, well, it looks like we have a range of responses so far. That's great. So our, our um, sense of this is that everyone has something to learn, including us, and we hope that um, you can share ideas with each other as well. OK, 
Okay, great. So let's turn it back over to Eva for an overview of population health data. Thanks, Nicole. So population health data, which is what is on the data share platform, um, shows um, data that measures health or quality of life. These are, uh, so the health indicators can include measurements of illness or disease, as well as behaviors and actions related to health and quality of life indicators include measurements related to economy, education, built environment, social environment, and transportation. Um, so some examples of population health issues are things like life expectancy, infant mortality, death rates, disability, quality of life, uh, self-assessed self -assessed health, happiness, and well-being. Um, and these are measures uh, that are used to look at the, the health of a whole population. But population health issues also include the major factors that impact the health of a group of people. And these issues often relate to the very structure of our society and expand beyond medical practices or healthcare. Um, so these can include things like income inequality, political, economic, and social status, gender, race, education, social capital, social cohesion, um, which um, can, you know, can mean uh, a variety of things, but how do people participate in their community? Um, psychosocial relationships, as well as issues of access to basic needs, food, clean water, shelter, and safe environment, and measures of poverty. So yeah, so when you think about all the different kinds of data there are, the ones that are on data share are really this larger set of population health indicators. So we also wanted to talk about why the, the data that Eva just reviewed are important. And that iceberg image, let me go back to it, um, has to do with the idea that there's a lot under the surface of the data points that we might see that we can explore on data share. And so for example, um, a, a hospital might use this type of data for a community health needs assessment or a CHNA. They're looking at the data about a whole population for a geographic area, even people who might never become their patients because the behaviors and health status and outcomes in a, in a community might affect what the hospital and its uh, providers want to be prepared for. So for example, uh, diabetes trends would be important to track. Health departments, same thing. Their uh, health departments more naturally gravitate towards population health data. That's a big cornerstone of public health to um, try to tilt towards prevention and look at what the disparities might be between different groups in, in society. So population health data that take this broader, deeper look are really important for that kind of analysis as well. And then um, there are lots of uses that might be relevant to others on, on our call today, like advocacy groups uh, might be using population health data to uh, pin some uh, progress or lack thereof on, on policies or ordinances that could really make a change in people's health outcomes, like making um, overdose reversal drugs like Narcan more available and accessible, what that could do, um, different kinds of ordinances about smoking, for example. And then uh, individual programs can use population health data to design and evaluate specific programs. So maybe you're choosing a baseline indicator or something that, um, that would help you gauge whether your program is having an impact. Um, on a particular age group or a particular um, group of, of people who use your services. And so you can think of data share really as a, a sort of digital library for all kinds of population health data that come from a variety of sources. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing slides at this point and go back to um, sharing what the actual site looks like. And you'll see um, in the chat, an, a link to this page that shows where some of data shares data actually come from. So you'll see a variety of national sources on this page. There are some local sources that are constantly being updated, but this is just to give you an idea of the incredible variety of data sources that show up here. 
And then the data on data share from all of these different sources are further organized by health categories that correlate to the social determinants of health that Eva reviewed. And those are on the um, indicators by location level that you can get to from this data tab. You can see it here. And this um, grouping shows you for a variety of indicators, which ones are available by zip code, for example. And they're grouped by different categories with lots of indicators within them. So if you know exactly what you're looking for, this is a lot easier to navigate to, but it also can benefit from um, just scrolling through a category and seeing what else is available that you may or may not have thought of for your purpose. So there are hundreds of indicators on data share. Even if it's overwhelming, um, it, it really does reward some time spent looking through these. And you can search in a lot of different ways, but some of the um, groupings and categories that are already here for you include the core results menu. And that the easiest way to get to that with indicators organized by core condition is to go to the local progress page, which is one of the main tabs on the data share landing page and to find core results menu. So if you'd like to follow along, that's the way to get there. And I just want to remind everyone that you can translate these pages into Spanish and other languages. So here's the core results menu. And here you can scroll over the eight core conditions and indicators within them. So that's just another starting point as a way to try to um, explore something that's of particular relevance to your work and what other indicators may be connected to it. So those are just uh, three ways that you can look at data sources, groupings of indicators, and a curated list like the core results menu. So with that, I will stop my screen share and turn it over to Nicole Young. Okay. I'm also going to share my screen now, so we'll still be looking at the data share site. Basically, I'm going to pick up where Nicole Luzin left off when we were looking at the indicators by location level. And so, not only are they do they tell you here what geographic level you can view data by, but also you can see uh, these large kind of broad categories of indicators, and then everything listed under them. So I'm going to keep scrolling down. We are going to look at a particular indicator today for just as an example. We're going to scroll down to health as the broad category, healthcare access and quality as the subcategory. And we are going to look at, um, sorry, I think I actually, <laughs> I'm trying to find the, Indicator here, it was, I know I had it a moment ago. Oh, we're looking for workers who walk, did it disappear? It would be under transportation. Oh, okay. Good thing we've got Eva on here. <laughs> the categories are helpful, but it's an interesting library sometimes. You can also, um, put it into the search if the list is long. This is like a, a great way if you're wanting to find out all of the indicators by category, but um, I get lost all the time, even when I know the categories. So, yes. Okay. So here we are. And Gisela put the direct link in the chat as well for the workers who walk to work. Um, and so we're using this one as an example because it actually has a lot of good information here. So you can get a sense of what you might find on an indicator page when you arrive at it. Not all of the indicators will have the same level of detail, but we thought this one would be a good example to use um, for today's workshop. So here we can see, again, the name of the indicator, workers who walk to work, 
We can see that this is, we're starting off looking at data that's available at a county level, but if you click on this little down arrow, you can see you could actually choose a different geographic level, whether it's a regional level by zip code or a specific census place. And we're gonna stick with county for now. And then you'll also see in every indicator page that tells you what the period of time is or the measurement period that this data represents. And so usually the indicator pages will default to whatever the most recent measurement period is. In this case, it's 2017 to 2021. But again, if you see a little arrow pointing down here, you can actually then and forth uh, and choose different time periods. So it takes a moment there. So you Nicole, can, can see... I just interrupt for one second? There's a, a question in the chat about that very issue on the lag time of data. Um, yeah, so the lag time will depend on the actual, the original data source. Um, and so it might, you might find you know, depending on which indicator you're looking at, that the most recent year might vary depending on which indicator you're looking at and where that data comes from. Um, so all of the data, and we'll explain more about this as we go through each of these pages, all the indicator pages are set up um, pretty much the same way where you can, again, look at which geographic area or choose a geographic area. Uh, you can see which measurement period is and how recent the data is. It gives a little description or definition about the indicator you're looking at. Sometimes that language is helpful. Like if you're then trying to describe in a report or a grant application, the data that you're, um, that you've found, you're describing sometimes the description and this, why is this important section here can provide some really useful language for that. If you keep looking down here in this main section, you'll see again, just a reminder about what geographic area you're looking at. It tells you the current value of the data from the most recent measurement period. And then you'll see here what uh, it lists some things like the source of the original data, tells you again the measurement period, tells you who is actually responsible for maintaining the data and keeping it up to date on data share. So here we see it's Conduit Healthy Communities Institute that actually manages this whole um, platform that different communities use. Other times you might see data share Santa Cruz County listed here, meaning that it's Eva, it's Eric Morris who's also on this call today. It's basically our local team that is responsible for uploading the data, um, maintaining it so that when new data comes out that it gets updated on the site. So again, uh, all of those things, depending on the original data source and who's maintaining it, um, can really then affect like how current the data is on data share. And I would say if you ever have a question, Ev is a great resource to reach out to. I see that um, she's also answered in the chat that in terms of the source lag time, some of the lag is due to COVID, that some of the, again, some of the data sources either paused their own data collection efforts during COVID or the data was just uh, too unstable, too small to be able to then uh, update and publish data in the same way as previous years. So a lot of little caveats that this is part of the why we're um, holding these data literacy uh, kind of beginner's guide sessions because there's a lot of nuances and little caveats to be aware of whenever you're looking at data, whether it's on data share or another platform. A couple other things I want to point out before I turn it over to George. Um, you'll see also on every indicator page some icons that look like gauges or arrows that tell you how our local data in Santa Cruz County is doing compared to other California or across the whole nation. Tells you what the trend is looking like compared to California and the United States and just the overall trend in our in our county or in the geographic area you're looking at. Is it getting better? Is it staying the same? Is it getting worse? Um, and you'll see then a couple um, charts here that tell you um, kind of the, what the data looks like over time. George is gonna say more about how to read those kinds of charts. Um, over here on the left, I just wanna point out that um, Pretty much all of the indicators will show you a chart that shows the changes over time. So you can see again here, 
kind of, it kind of tells you like, what is the shape of the data? Are there dips? Are there peaks? Is it pretty flat? And then um, when the data is available in this way, when it's collected and analyzed in this way by the original data source, we can often then look at data broken out by different subgroups, by age, gender, race, or ethnicity. Uh, some of the data you might find is available by sexual orientation. Um, not every indicator has all of these options here. So just know that if you don't see those options, it's because the original data source doesn't provide it in that way. And so I think I'm going to stop at this point um, and let George take over from here to get, explain a little bit more about some of these technical notes or really how to understand what you uh, see in some of these charts. Thank you, uh, Nicole. Um, so um, welcome everyone. And, and this is kind of the, the part where we're gonna get into a little bit more technical information uh, about how these um, indicators work and talk about how uh, you can interpret them and, and some of the ways that they can be useful in your own work. And so I've um, put up the workers who walk to work. And so you can see, um, the comparisons and the, the uh, change over time. And I think one thing that's really important to know about much of the data on data share is that the, the sources, which we showed earlier, rely on sampling and surveying of the population, which means these data sources are creating estimates by surveying you know, much smaller portions of the population. And so it's really important to understand how sample size, the frequency of data collection and the methodology impacts how you understand the data and how you use it uh, along with your program data or other community data sources to really paint a full picture of the issue you're trying to understand. Now in DataShare, one of the things that they've tried to do is provide some ways of, of analyzing these estimates and understanding where there's variability uh, in, in what they're estimating. So one of the nice things on, on many charts and not on all, and we'll, we'll talk about what, what you can do when there's not these estimates, you can click on the little hamburger and click on show confidence intervals. And now uh, confidence intervals, you know, they're, they're maybe not be all familiar to you or if you took math or statistics back in high school or college, this may be a blast from the past, but really what a, a confidence interval does is it shows the range of values that um, if you conducted the survey a hundred times, uh, in this case, it's census data. So 90% of the time that you conducted that, that 100 surveys, the actual range that you would find would be between these two points. So if you're looking at 16 to 19 year olds, that means that 90% you know, of the time, the value would be between 20% and 27.4%. And so why that's important is that if you're trying to say, well, do uh, workers who walk to work who are between 16 to 19, is that really more than the other groups? Mm -hmm. And the confidence interval lets you say, yes, you can see that there's no overlapping confidence interval. So yes, that uh, younger individuals in Santa Cruz are, are more likely to walk to work. And so um, you can do that for many of these groups. So you can do it by gender. Um, and so you can see here, it's why you can see that these have overlapping confidence intervals. And so you, one way, one thing that you would say from that is that there's no uh, statistically significant difference in the number of males and females who walk to work in Santa Cruz County. Um, and so one thing I wanna um, point out um, with this is that the uh, all of our surveys and especially when you start disaggregating data rely on um, this surveying and so I'm going to switch over to our Santa Cruz demo oops not that one sorry let me uh, okay. um, so if you look at Santa Cruz demographics, and especially when you get into smaller populations or smaller regions, you're going to see that they're, because of the size of Santa Cruz, many of our groups don't have very many people. So we'll take um, Black or African American as an example. You can see that there's 
the census estimates there's only about 2,800 uh, of those individuals in the county. And so the census um, samples about 1.5% of all households in Santa Cruz County each year to make their estimates. And that's about 1,400 households. And so, you know, on a practical matter, that means African, the African American head of households, only about 12 households are surveyed by the American Community Survey to create these estimates in any year. So you can imagine if you're only surveying 12 households that your estimates are gonna be, you know, be highly variable um, based on that. And it means that sometimes those estimates can be unstable. And you'll see sometimes in data share that they will mark certain indicators, especially when you disaggregate as unstable. And what that means practically is that you need to use those estimates with caution and really um, not necessarily discount what you're seeing, but uh, layer it in context with what you know about the community and what you know about your own population you're serving and other data sources. Um, and so if you go back to these workers who walk alone and you turn on the confidence intervals, you'll see that for some of those smaller um, groups in Santa Cruz County, you have, you know, really wide confidence intervals. And that's because, um, because there's so few of these particular individuals in the survey, the estimate is going to uh, vary widely. So um, one thing you may be asking yourself is so like what does this mean for using this data if I'm working for parks or I'm working with older adults and I really want to be able to look at some of this disaggregation and as I mentioned before what you really want to do with this is um, put it in context so for example um, we may see disparities with African Americans or Asians or in other groups, and you want to be able to layer other data sources and other information along with it. And so one of the things that you may want to do is look at other reports. So um, for example, um, the United Way uh, worked with the Black Health Matters and did a report that looked specifically at Black and African American health outcomes. And so you may see disparities in health outcomes for Black and African Americans and data share, and they may or may not be statistically significant, and you'll see the, the confidence intervals very widely. So you really want to be able to kind of take that data, um, put it in context, and, um, and kind of work, work with different um, parts of it. So I, um, oops. So, th so that was a, a lot. Um, and so one of the things that um, right. we want to sh show you is uh, some of the, the glossaries and ways that you can kind of refer back to some of these concepts in data share. So let me share, oops. Um, and this is, I, I, I think uh, so I'll put this in the chat. And so one of the things you may want to uh, go back to is these glossary of terms when you're reviewing data specific specifically for some of these ideas. And so one thing when you're looking at health-related uh, data, and I'm not going to go through every single um, of these glossary terms, but highlight a couple of these on each page. But um, age-adjusted um, really is a way of trying to um, understand health, particularly health-related indicators and adjust for the fact that, say, uh, older adults uh, uh, tend to pass away at a greater rate than, say, teenagers. And so age-adjusted takes into account the differences between groups to give you a rate um, that may, is more comparable. And again, that confidence interval that I spoke about, this gives you a, a practical example of what that means. So if you kind of forget or need to explain it to someone else, you have it here. And again, um, as we showed in the workers who walk to work example, the way that um, data share um, defines significant difference is that there is not overlapping confidence intervals. And one thing I'll note is that in data share, the way that they've defined this and used this practically is that it's always 
the significant difference is always between the overall or county rate and those specific subgroups. So if you want to be able to compare uh, between groups like uh, racially or gender, um, you need to kind of do that um, analysis yourself. So those the, the color isn't going to indicate what that looks like. So I'll show you. So for example, in this, right, the green, uh, which is significantly better than the overall, but you ought, would need to look at it and say, okay, well, uh, African Americans walk um, more to work than, say, Hispanics, and you can either eyeball the the confidence interval not overlapping, or you can um, download the data as a CSV, and it will have the estimates and the confidence intervals in an ex like a spreadsheet that you can also uh, look and, and analyze. Um, and so I think. You know, we've talked about comparisons uh, a bit, and I just want to underscore what Nicole talked about in that data share. Also, one of the nice things it does is that for many measures that it has state and national data on, it will provide comparisons. And some of those have been tested. Um, those comparisons um, will show you what the, the state and the national level is so that you can really look at um, how the county is faring against others. And then you can also see some trends over time. And the um, data share for many measures has presented a um, either a statistically significant increase or decrease. And also in the um, notes, it will tell you how they calculated it, but it will allow you to kind of say, are we doing better or worse on a number of indicators? And so, um, I'll end with just saying, you know, how I use um, data share and demographic data in, in my work, you know, is, is it's really a starting point to understand um, community and uh, data and access information that doesn't exist anywhere else. And so the data is not perfect. A lot of these are estimates that you have to use with caution and put in context but it is the best and only data we have on so many of these indicators. And if we want to be data informed, it's a really great place to start. And it's really the only way that we can understand how different groups racially, geographically are impacted. And so, you know, for human services, we have many programs that are very large and probably larger than uh, what your, your programs work with. For example, our, our medical program serves Know, over a third of the, the people in, in Santa Cruz. And so when I do things like try to understand, you know, do we serve um, disproportionate numbers of people in programs? Um, it, it's very powerful to be able to look at the county demographics and be able to say, yes, we serve more uh, Hispanic or Latinos um, than other groups and understand um, kind of geographically and racially and, and some of these other impacts, like how are we doing in terms of outreach and who are we serving and where are there pockets um, of the county that we could be serving better or differently. Um, and so I think that with your, you know, your programs and your data, I would, would um, encourage you to, to use data share and think about how do you understand the problems that you're you're trying to resolve in the community? Who are you serving? Where, where is your, your reach in your programs? And, and think about how to leverage this information that, you know, the, be the best you can. And with that, I am going to turn it over, back over to Nicole Listen, George, thanks, Nicole. So now we're gonna have a chance to practice um, what we've just heard about. And we're gonna do that with a, a very informal, low stakes, no prize scavenger hunt. Sorry, and do we have time for questions? Oh yeah, yeah, we do. Okay. Does anyone have a question before we do that? Don't be shy. I do. Okay, um, great, go ahead, Laura. Okay. so. With a couple of the graphs, there's like a green or red coloration of this is good, this is bad. Um, sometimes there's other colors as well. Who is deciding or like what is deciding what is determined as good or bad? Great question. So for example, like number of residents who eat fresh fruits and vegetables per day, if we if it's a high percentage, that's 
probably going to lead to better health outcomes. But in the example of number of residents who have diabetes, you actually want a low percentage to for better health, health outcomes. So how do you decide which gets the green coloration versus red coloration? I don't know exactly the algorithm that they use, but I think they probably use those comparisons that George talked about to um, either state averages or national goals. So who is above or below a certain line and which direction that trend line is for a particular indicator. So as, as you've noted, sometimes it's going to be um, above and sometimes above, sometimes being above is better and sometimes being below is better. Um, but there, there are these comparisons that you can see right now. Um, compared to California counties. Um, to the US trends. Yeah. Yeah. So the, there's a few ways that the comparison um, analysis happens. Um, so you can see when it's compared to like some, what, what Nicole is saying is, is totally spot on. Um, and the analysts of the platform where we get all our data from to put it in our library, um, they do this basic analysis as George was um, saying so that we can have a basic picture. The California and the U.S. value has this rate that you can see here um, in terms of um, of what it's compared to and where it stands on the scale. Um, th sometimes you'll see it compared also to a target value. So many of these indicators um, that fall under a category of social determinants of health under the healthy people target. People. 2030. People target for 2030, um, which is a um, indicator of health and wellness um, that is measured nationally, um, it will have a target trend as well. So are we getting close to that target? Have we met that target? Um, also, if you are in a uh, in a collaborative countywide, or if um, you're working with the county on a particular goal, sometimes it'll also have a target rate there. So it'll, it, it, we can gauge it by um, where we want to be um, locally. So I don't know if that completely answers your question, but each value actually has an analysis to it that will, that will say whether it's positive or negative um, and uh, whether an increase is bad or good um, or state or statistically different and neutral um, is dependent on that indicator. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? You know, we, th we threw a lot at you. Okay, do we wanna see how this might work for each of you? We thought it might be, um, we know from our own experience, sometimes listening to how to do this is different from just diving in and doing it yourself. So we thought, it might be um, a good idea to just ask people to practice this together just for a couple minutes. Um, we're gonna set a timer and there's a link in the chat that Gisela just posted that um, has a list of, of uh, indicators that are grouped into a little dashboard. And what we want you to do is to choose one. Um, let me share my screen and so you can see where you're landing. So you might have um, under health and healthcare access and quality, the people with a usual source of care. So what you would do is hover over the one that you're interested in and click on it. So here's some other ones, community crime uh, and crime prevention. You could look at the adult arrest rate by clicking on that little highlighted piece. Um, if you're interested in housing, maybe you want to look at the, uh, renter spending to income ratio, which is an important national and state measure, children who are living below the poverty level by age, we've got people 65 and older living below the poverty level. So just, just pick one that speaks to you. And uh, Gisela will put in the chat to uh, what, what we'd like you to look for. So we're hoping that you'll try to find um, the source of the data 
something about the measurement period that was a question that came up how, how recent is it and then is anything striking to you from looking at the the data we talked a little bit about these comparisons is there a trend going in one direction whatever whatever uh strikes you is fair game not a quiz or a test just just a little excuse to delve in here and see if you can find the data source the measurement period and some reaction or insight um, from looking at it and then we'll come back and compare notes. Need a little more time? Rose, I see your hand up, go ahead. Excuse me, so I went to the education data um, at, uh, at the bottom. Let me pull it up on my other screen for myself, hold on. And Rose, if you want to share your screen to show us what you were looking at, you, you're welcome to do that. Well, unfortunately, I'm, I'm running two computers. Okay. One, one where I can actually read the stuff and one where I can talk to you. Okay. Um, so I looked at people 25 plus with a high school diploma or higher. Um, and I'm absolutely intrigued by the amount of, well, the different data sources one can that, that kind of came into this, both the primary source and then all the other stuff. Uh, I'm trying to think what the three questions were. Well, that's one. Um, the measurement period, I didn't look at that, I should, sorry. Um, but then uh, uh, just as a point of interest, I went through and looked at it uh, by zip code to see what the variation is across the county. Um, and I, I just I just found that very, very interesting. Um, certainly, <clears throat> you know, excuse me, when I think of the um, County Office of Education and all those the different school districts and that kind of stuff, they would be very, very interested in this kind of information. And I, so I guess my question is, how well are we promoting you, all your work, Eva, so that people have access to it? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> well, we, we have well, we some do our best. Yeah, we do our best. We, we do work in a collaborative of um, 15 agencies, and we have... Um, on our steering committee representation um, from Cabrillo and UCSC um, and COE. Um, so in terms of like this particular indicator, I know at least there is some understanding of um, how we interact with education data. Um, we're always, um, you know, trying to do specific outreach with um, different interest groups. And, um, you know, I, I see a couple uh, specific interests um, folks here, disability, education, um, uh, child care. So sometimes we'll do spotlights on specific measures. So um, for example, we did one um, on housing in which we build um, a basic analysis of um, the housing data, not the only the population health indicators. We start there, but then we add the local reports and um, agency impacts and um, kind of the, the system frameworks that are being used to address that particular area. Um, so, yeah. And I will say, I, I just wanted to um, note that on the the breakouts by region, it can be really interesting. It's also an important place to remember, kind of like remember George's voice about um, what is the confidence interval on those regions. And those graphs, I don't think they have that capacity to tell you like, this zip code for this measure has this confidence interval. Um, I've actually, I don't know if I've looked at that recently. Um, but each zip code has a different population number. So it's just, it's just something to note. I, I personally don't like to make, um, uh, any an basic analysis statements off of the zip code because of the variance in population per zip code in our county from rural to uh, more urban. Um, but I do really like the regional breakouts. I think that those can be helpful because they 
they group a number of zip codes together. Um, so in terms of trying to look at these, sometimes you can look at a zip code and be like, wow, how is that so distinct? Um, but I just think it's important to frame it in, you know, well, what is, you know, what is the population density in that particular zip code versus um, another one? I don't know if you would add anything there. Oh yeah, they, they do have a confidence interval. That's awesome. So the reason, excuse me, okay, get rid of it. The reason I ask is some time ago, we did a study of all the social services that were available to students and put it into a graph on the COE's website somewhere I know not, um, where you could slice and dice by some of, some of these same variables, gender, age, type of service, um, and you can you could come down fairly specific, but you know data is as good as it's promoted. So here's all this wonderful data that's being collected and updated by the COE, and I have no idea if it rolls into any of these things, which is unfortunate. So thank you very very much for doing all this work. Thank you for the question, Rose, and the and the um, successful scavenger hunt. Um, would anyone else like to share their exploration? On, maybe on a different indicator, did anybody do one of the... Oh, Daniel, go ahead, see your hand up. Hi there, Daniel Wilson. I work with uh, George in uh, Business Analytics for the County of Santa Cruz, and I pulled up the home renter spending income ratio. Mm -hmm. Quite uh, enlightening. Um, a little bit different than I was expecting. Um, how, how, I, so? how is it different? Well, I was under the understanding that we were number one, <laughs> and yeah. it looks like we're number two. <laughs> okay. Um, but very cool. I mean, and thank you for the uh, deep dive into the website. I've been into the website quite a bit, but not nearly um, to this level that you guys have shown um, with the different graphs. Um, I looked at the regional um, uh, presentation on the renter spending and, uh, again, enlightening on the different areas. Um, one would think that uh, downtown Santa Cruz would be a little bit more um, higher level. Um, but yeah, very, very enlightening, very cool stuff. So thank you for everything that you guys are doing. Um, we appreciate it. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. So that we find this every time we go in here, that there is always another layer to discover. There's always another, um, aspect of the data that, that we may not even have been looking for. There's lots of accidental discoveries. And again, it can be overwhelming, but really rewards spending some time and um, Eva will explain in just a moment that she holds office hours and is available for training and can help you group indicators um, on dashboards for your organization. And they're just, there's just a wealth of opportunity to, to interpret and use data here um, that most of us are, you know, it's, it's untapped potential for, for the most part. So that's why we're, that's exactly why we're doing this series to help people um, see that and start using it themselves and spread the word. So if each of you who are here today might tell one colleague about this, that would be a great um, impact of our, our session and we'll have more to follow. Um, we're running out of time, but is there anybody else who wants to share maybe in the chat something you discovered from your scavenger hunt? And I'll turn it over to Eva to let us know some other ways to keep learning together. Thanks. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I will say that I always get confused by the confidence interval. So thank you, George. I think that that was like one of the, I'm, I'm always like, okay, just remember how to do this confidence interval thing. Um, <laughs> so I do have office hours, um, and I'm available, um, via, uh, my contact information, which will be shared, um, and uh, follow up email. Um, so you can always learn more in our about us section on the website and sign up for our newsletter. Um, we send them every two months ish um, and um, reach out for personalized training for you or your group um, for reporting or other needs. Um, and um, 
Yeah, uh, we also have, uh, we're going to offer more trainings. Here are some that are coming up with CORE. Um, and my office hours are the first and second Thursdays of every month. These are in person and in Watsonville and Capitola. So um, I will put those into the uh, chat box. You just need to sign up. Um, so, yeah. You can see links in the chat for all of the things Eva's just mentioned and the upcoming core events that will allow you to register and learn more about them. And we're gonna be repeating this uh, session, this beginner's guide to data literacy. We're going to repeat this three more times this fiscal year. So if you thought this was really helpful and you think others in your organization would find it useful as well, uh, encourage them to sign up for future sessions. So um, the next time that we'll do this beginner's guide to data literacy is on January 30th. Uh, we don't yet have the registration link active for that one yet, but we will soon. Um, and then in between these beginner's guide to data literacy workshops, we'll also do a joint workshop between core and data share um, to do a little bit more of the practice on, okay, how do you actually use the data that you find for things like planning and evaluation? That will be our focus for the November 28th session. Um, that could tie into things like how to use community indicators for grant writing when you're trying to make a case for a particular program or service that you're proposing to a funder. So we'll keep doing more and more of these kinds of um, workshops where it's a combination of, you know, hands-on practice using data share, but then really thinking about, okay, how do you actually use that data in your everyday work? Um, and then again, well, as Nicole said, we have some more core coffee chats coming up in October. Um, and pretty soon the human services department is going to be announcing some dates for some community engagement sessions. Uh, because the county and the city of Santa Cruz are starting to plan for the next request for proposals or, or RFP for core funding. So there are going to be some uh, sessions where you'll get to weigh in on or share your thoughts about using a data-informed approach to setting priorities. And so um, this ties in really well to being familiar with data share. Some, I think all of the indicators on that dashboard that George put together are actually indicators that the county is looking at in terms of um, really getting an understanding or a big picture of health and well-being in our county. So lots coming up. Uh, I encourage you to keep checking out the CORE website. And if you haven't yet uh, signed up for our CORE newsletter uh, that comes out from uh, Nicole Lezemi, we encourage you to do that. You can sign up for it on the CORE website. Uh, we're getting ready to send out our October issue. And then last but not least, if you can take a moment to fill out the feedback survey for today's event, that would be fantastic. Gisela put the link in the chat already. Um, you can also scan the QR code that you see on the screen if you have your uh, phone handy. We do appreciate feedback and it helps us learn how we can uh, improve or continuously improve in each core event. So love to get your feedback. Thanks Thank everyone. you to George and Eva for leading a great workshop with us.